Okay, well, welcome to What Does the Afro Future Say? I am your host, Ingrid LaFleur, and today we are with Pierce Freelon, who is live from Durban, North Carolina, on the eastern side of the United States, and I am live from Johannesburg. Welcome, Pierce. It's good to hey, see you. Hey, how are you? I'm <laughs> good, I'm good. Uh, as attendees are coming in, please uh, feel free to ask us any questions. You can just write it down below and I will catch them and we will read them uh, for Pierce to, to answer. So where do we begin? It's been a while since I've seen you. The last time we were, where, where were we? We're at Duke, right? Yeah, yeah. Duke. Yep, Duke University here in Durham. Uh, how is Durham doing uh, right now with COVID? Uh, we're hanging in there. Um, the mayor a couple weeks ago uh, ordered a, a shutdown that kind of aligned with our, our governor's mandate uh, for, you know, social distancing and, and uh, you know, can't do anything, can't play basketball, just essential, essential only. So uh, Durham has been pretty good about, um, uh you know, keep it flattening the curve and keeping our distance. And so things are kind of slowly, slowly opening back up. Um, but, you know, uh, th there are, uh, there's levels and um, Durham has some of the highest income inequality, actually the highest income inequality in the state of North Carolina. Um, so it's a, it's a real tale of two cities. There are um, you know, folks who are, are really struggling and folks who are, are, are hanging in there and folks who are, you know, on vacay, on vacay. So, um, you know, we, we've been trying to make sure that um, those that, that need the, you know, the, the basic resources are taken care of, that the kids uh, who go to school for lunch every day are fed and, you um, well, there was a crisis, a, a carbon monoxide crisis here in Durham in one of our housing projects uh, just prior to the COVID outbreak. Uh, so these are families like living in hotels because um, there was, uh, you know, unsafe living conditions and hazardous um, you know, elements in their homes. Um, so, but we just got word last week that all the folks have been moved back into their houses so that, that we put a uh, a close to that crisis within a crisis. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're doing our best, um, but it's, it's tough. I'm sure it's tough. It's tough to watch from, from here, <laughs> but it's, it's tough everywhere. You know, this is, this is a shift that's upending all that we know and understand and all of these systems and we're coming to understand how fragile these systems are. Yeah. Um, so you are the founder of Black Space, which is in downtown Durham. Did you say it is downtown? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Really, yeah. I, I got a chance to visit when I was there last, yeah. and uh, I really love that space. Can you tell us about the space and how you guys are shifting or adapting to uh, this quarantine? Yeah. Well, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna evoke Detroit for for one second if I can. So. Um, <laughs> Black Space is a digital maker space for youth of African descent. And since maybe 2015, we've been taking a group of young kids to Detroit every summer for the Allied Media Conference. Um, and for those of y'all don't know, Allied Media is this great uh, social justice, digital activism conference that takes place in your uh, town, uh, your previous town. Uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and it's just a really wonderful place. I often tell the kids, like, we're about to step into, uh, you know, 3015 because the people, the spaces, the ideas, the thoughts, the collaborations, the vibe is like so in the future. And it's like, oh, Grace Lee Boggs, Adrian Marie Brown, Walida, you know, all these amazing people around. Uh, and so, uh, Last year, I think it was AMC's 25th anniversary, and they decided to take a year off. They called it a year in chrysalis, uh, where they were gonna, 
you know, hibernate in their cocoon so that they could do some intentional reflection and then reemerge the next year as a new powerful butterfly. And so last year, around the time AMC decided to take their chrysalis, Black Space, uh, taking a page uh, out of their book, went into our own chrysalis. And we had, uh, you know, some time to, to reflect, to build, to look on, um, you know, the past five years of, of growth and development and innovation and Afrofuturistic expansion and really challenging the kind of capitalist narrative that you need to always be on your grind and always have something to show and to hustle. We were like, nah, we're going to rest. We're going to, we're going to meditate. We're going to build. Um, and that's exactly what we've been doing for the past year. Now we were intending to relaunch in March mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that was when COVID hit. So that was a big like skirt, you know, we weren't, we weren't prepared for, um, you, you know, we were excited about kind of re-engaging uh, with the kids and the communities that we'd been serving for the previous, you know, five years. And so that's taken a, a big turn um, as we've had to shift from, you know, Black Space is a gathering space, it's a community space. So kids used to come in every Thursday, every Friday, we do a cipher. One, one, the one program that we didn't uh, stop in Chrysalis was called a cipher. It's a weekly gathering of teens, uh, mostly uh, black teens, and we rap and sing and make beats and do poetry together uh, every Friday uh, from 9.19 to 11 p.m. So we had to cancel the cypher and, um, you know, that's, it's basically a huddle. It's a Petri dish for germs. <laughs> so we, in fact, what we do there, we call it spitting. You know, it's like, it's rap. It's like, oh yeah, you should spit. It's like, no, we don't want to spit. No phlegm, no spit, no breathing, like six feet, you know, so uh, we've had to cancel the cipher and, um, and we're looking at uh, ways we can engage once it's safe to, to reconnect. Um, we have been doing some distance music collaborations. We're just sending files back and forth with students collaborating on different things. But um, other than that, uh, we've been, you know, we've been honoring the mandate to socially distance and we've been plotting for our eventual uh, opportunities to return and re-engage. Yes, I'm sure that the youth are really missing uh, the gathering and uh, it is a wonderful, beautiful, creative outlet. I enjoyed being in the studio space. Uh, am I remembering this correctly that some of the students helped you with the history of white people in America? Yeah, yeah, you got it. So, um, well, History of White People in America is this animated series about the history of race. Um, in fact, we are, will be premiering the first episode on the 4th of July um, this summer. Oh, cool. um, and yeah, 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 it'll be on, um, on, a, on YouTube uh, in, in about a month and a half. Okay. So, yeah, we're really excited about that. And yeah, the students were involved. Um, we had one student, Lourdes, was one of the engineers on the project um, doing recording. We had a couple students producing, uh, one of our young producers named Jam, which is an acronym for just another master musician. Shout out to Jam. Uh, he produced one of the tracks on episode two. And we had another a student as one of the voice actors. He was one of the characters in the series. So um, yes, it's this, uh, it's an animated musical about race, um, the, the, how it was constructed, for what purpose, and how it's developed and evolved uh, over the centuries. It was so fun to watch. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think everyone's going to really enjoy how history can be told in this like really engaging way. Uh, it was fun. It was really great. I'm looking forward to this. So where do we find out when it premieres? So um, if you go over to historyofwhitepeople.com, um, that's our like a website where you can watch the trailer. Um, I don't actually think we've posted the, like the link uh, where it will be live yet. Um, it'll be, we actually, right before this call, I had a call with the production team about uh, promoting and, and gearing up for that release. Um, so we'll have all those assets and things together by June, and then it'll be out on July 4th. 
but in the meantime, if you're interested in, in learning more about the series, you can go to historyofwhitepeople.com. And within the next week or two, we'll have all the details up for the premiere. Sweet. I'm looking forward to that. So yeah. what are you working on now, now that you're in quarantine? Well, did you, did you get the email I sent you yesterday with LeVar Burton in it? I listened to it beforehand. Okay. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, well, one of the things uh, I've been personally working on is a children's album. Um, I have uh, two beautiful uh, kids right in the other room. Um, who knows if they, they love busting in on my meetings. So if they get hungry or bored, you might see one of them uh, pretty soon. But um, I've been keeping voice notes on my phone, like, you know, voice memos um, of just song ideas for years. And one of the things I've been able to do in quarantine is go back to like 2008 and listen to all the voice memos. There was over like four or 500 voice memos wow. of just, you know, beatboxing song ideas, humming things, I'll tell my kids to do something, uh, you know, and then turn that into a hook or whatever. And, uh, and so I've just been compiling these, these tunes. Uh, and what I emailed you yesterday, I emailed you, uh, my friend Walida, my bro, my boy Hero, and uh, all Afrofuturist nerdy black friends of mine, uh, a song that I recorded yesterday in this room, actually, um, it's my office, um, called LeVar Burton which is uh, it's a song about one of my idols, LeVar Burton, who, um, who played Jordi LaForge on Star Trek. He played Kunta Kente on, in The Roots. And of course, he, he portrayed himself in Reading Rainbow. Um, and so uh, there's a song on the children's album which talks about those things and the way that, and the way that LeVar kind of, he's the quintessential Afrofuturist, past, present, future, you know, fighting Romulans, fighting illiteracy, fighting slavery. He's just a man. So uh, I thought that kids who, who may not have grown up in the 90s and ever seen Reading Rainbow or may not be aware of Star Trek, TNG, or The Roots for that matter, uh, come check this brother out. This time traveling, highly intelligent chief engineer on the Enterprise out. So um, anyway, that song is called Jordy LaForge. I just sent it to you. You can check it out after the call. Yes, yes. I cannot wait to listen to it. But I, I thought it was really interesting that you were working on um, uh, an album for youth and or children, right? For young mm -hmm. children, right? That's exciting. Yeah. I love that. And uh, so I'm curious, you are, you're so many things. You're a scholar, you're a music producer, um, you work with youth. I love how you work with youth. And you ran for mayor of Dur Durham. Mm -hmm. You ran for mayor the same year that I did. Um, and we're both Afrofuturists. I'm curious to know what are your thoughts about Durham moving forward post quarantine, um, hopefully post pandemic. Um, what what does Durham? What kind of policies do you think need to be put in place that help promote healing while also restructuring um, economies and the way we're living and so on and so forth. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, there you go. You're back. I That's see you now. Sorry. That's so crazy. I got completely knocked off. <laughs> okay, you're back though. Yeah. Good. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, can you, do you mind starting over for the recording? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, do you want to ask the question again? Because I lost some of the question too. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was saying that uh, your career is so diverse, and I love that you're an Afrofuturist as well, and you ran for mayor of Dur Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I wanted to know what your thoughts are about Durham moving into the future post pandemic, post quarantine. Um, what is uh, housing policies or all, what kind of policies should be put in place that promote healing since we're going through cl and a collective deep trauma? 
Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting that there's a, a group of organizers. Durham has such a, a rich creative community, such a rich organizing community. And uh, there's some folks here with the uh, Southern Coalition for Social Justice and other organizing groups that are uh, organizing a National Day of Healing um, and thinking about, I guess it's an International Day for Healing, or it should be, um, that is kind of thinking about different healing modalities and ways we can um, really be present to the trauma that people are, are going through right now and you know everything from folks who've who've lost loved ones and haven't been able to properly grieve them um you know haven't been able to to be in physical contact uh even with loved ones as they're ailing but even also you know high school graduates that that are are grieving the the lost opportunity to walk across the stage or to celebrate um you know this rite of passage um here and that that we celebrate here in this culture so i think that uh the first thing we need to do is 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 acknowledge that and, and think about ways we can bring artists and healers and spiritual practitioners uh you know together to um to do some of that healing and um, one of the spaces we do that in Durham is at North Star Church of the Arts, which is a, a creative space in Durham that my dad founded, my father and mom. My dad passed away last year. He was an architect. And um, he really believed in the, in the intersection of uh, spirituality and creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that that that's that's one of the spaces where we try to practice what we preach so you know uh the, the one of the ways that impacts our community in durham um we've started through north star a um an artist fund uh, and we've raised tens of thousands of dollars to help support local artists who um have been impacted by COVID 19 um, we are working with uh, Jillian Johnson, who is our mayor pro tem, on getting masks and uh, protective equipment distributed to vulnerable communities throughout Durham. Um, we've been, uh, my mom, on, who's a jazz vocalist, her name is Nina Freelon. We're talking with the Durham Center for Senior Life on doing some digital programming for seniors in our community who, you know, like the rest of us are isolated, but if you're over 65, you have that added kind of risk factor um, of just being someone who's particularly vulnerable to COVID. Um, so we've been doing and thinking and dreaming through ways that we can provide uh, some relief and some joy and some fun for our elders. So there's that intergenerational piece. So for me, you know, all of this is work that um, you know, I wouldn't call it political work, um, but it, it certainly speaks to the values that I was running on, and, and it speaks to, in an Afrofuturist way, it speaks to the type of world that we want, want to create for ourselves and taking the steps to manifesting those spaces. And I feel really privileged uh, by my father, who and his own transition crawled into a chrysalis and emerged into his own little butterfly as an ancestor. He's now working on the other side through North Star to create opportunities for us to uh, expand that impact. Um, so I feel really uh, blessed to have him uh, continue to be a presence even as he's transitioned through creating space with North Star. Um, yeah, in terms of policy, yeah, housing. I, I mentioned we have this um, we have this uh, carbon monoxide crisis in one of the um, largest public housing pro projects in Durham, or the largest public housing project. Um, immediately prior to the carbon monoxide uh, incident, um, we were organizing to get them to stop evictions. And I think this is a really important public policy thing because we got with the 
with the head of our, um, uh, what do you call it, um, public housing authority, mm -hmm. Durham Housing Authority, a guy named Anthony Scott. Um, first of all, well, first, before we sat with him, we went all around Durham putting up signs saying, stop eviction, stop eviction, stop evictions. And then my daughter and I, we were canvassing the Christmas or the holiday parade. And, and she made this video about, you know, it's cruel to put people out in, on the streets in the middle of the winter. It's cold outside. This is not a time to be evicting folks. You know, you're criminalizing poverty, basically. This is my nine-year-old daughter. And, uh, you know, that was really impactful and got a lot of people talking about young kids being active and engaged and, um, and, and being proactive about doing something about it. So this really forced uh, the hand of, of the housing authority to sit down and meet with us. And we were like, yo, y'all need to stop evicting people, particularly during the holidays. But, you know, folks aren't able to, uh, you know, cover their rent. They're dealing with issues with the housing. They're, they're dealing with issues with finding gainful employment, which can allow them to pay their rent. And the housing authority was like, no, we're not going to stop evictions. Like, how could we stop evictions? Like, this is, this is what we do. We're, we're, we're trying to, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but they were trying to, uh, you know, people account and whatever excuses they gave. And then COVID, you know, a month later, there was the, there was the housing uh, crisis with the um, carbon monoxide which forced them to stop charging people rent. And then there was the COVID crisis, which uh, was another situation where they were not collecting rent. And, and all those excuses about why they couldn't uh, uh, stop evicting. Here's another thing, the D, not the DA, uh, the, um, well, yeah, I guess the DA uh, announced that she was going to stop uh, prosecuting folks for delinquent kind of rent payments. And, and, and the sheriff said he was gonna stop enforcing uh, evictions. You know, so uh, the COVID has created this, you know, unprecedented circumstance, which has pushed all these public officials from the sheriff's office to the DA's office, to the Durham Housing Authority, to do the things we were already at this crisis. And meanwhile, the people who live in these housing projects have been in crisis, you know, for, for, for weeks, for months, for years prior to this pandemic. And, and so it's just interesting to me moving forward, how we identify what is a crisis? What is the appropriate circumstance that would make it appropriate not to kick a family out on the street, mm. not to, you know, file for an eviction, not to, you know, the, the, there's this sense of shared solidarity and destiny and crisis with the pandemic that folks who are privileged enough to, to, to not be in the trenches might not feel, you know, before, might not have felt before March, but that we can, tap into and, and use as precedent to say no sheriff, no DA, no housing authority. There are conditions under which you, you will not move forward with these practices that are criminalizing poverty. How do we take that same sense of urgency and apply it back when we're not forcing ourselves to be socially distant? And, and how do we, uh, excuse my French, but how do we call like BS um, folks who say that they can't, that their hands are tied, you know, for some reason, when they actually do have the authority to yeah. do what we're asking them to do, you know, and so to me, that, that that's the opportunity. You talked earlier about fragile system, is how do we take this moment and, uh, and hold our public, uh, public servants, keyword servant, how do we hold our public servants accountable to serving the most vulnerable in our community? And that goes across the board. Yeah, that's so true. I, the, the pandemic has centered uh, some sense of humanity or forced, forced us to act in a more humane way. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, I don't know, you know, how long do you think this will hold? Do you think that now that the public is aware that we could possibly have universal basic income or we can stop evicting people uh, who from public housing units like since we we know that certain things can actually happen that we've been advocating for for years and decades it, it just stopped it happened like that do you think that we it will continue on into the future do you think the public will demand that more often well, I think that, uh, you know, you talked earlier about the crumbling, uh, uh, fragile systems that um, our society is kind of based on. And uh, I read a, I scrolled through an Instagram post earlier today um, about, it was talking about the Matrix and how Neo and the Matrix, you know, once he, once he wa had the wool, you know, pulled back and, and had kind of clear vision about what the matrix was, he couldn't unsee it. And so I hear this happening on a bunch of different levels. So there are the areas that we just talked about as it relates to public housing, universal base income. Um, also people, uh, what do you call those things? Are you familiar with the CSA? It's like um, a direct uh, farm to, to house <laughs> bucket of food, Yes. like fresh food. So, so, you know, because we can't go to the grocery store, we've been getting CSAs. We just got a CSA today. It was delivered by one of my, my former students from UNC. It was crazy. Um, and so uh, my wife and I were talking like, why haven't, where, where have we been? Like CSAs didn't just show up out of nowhere. They've been around and now I know how to cook collard greens. I made some kimchi the other day. At us. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with a head full of cabbage? I don't like cabbage. So I looked it up, I, I chopped up some chim kimchi and, and jarred it, it was delicious. But, you know, we, we're, we're like circumventing uh, our traditional marketplaces of, you know, Food Lion or Whole Foods or whatever, and we're going straight to the farmers. There's a black CSA in Durham that serves, uh, that, that pulls crops specifically from, from black farmers in North Carolina. And, uh, and, and we're just wondering what, why haven't we been going small, local, black, like from the jump, you know, and how can we, how can we pay a little extra on our black farm CSA to make sure that they're dropping off buckets in the hood where it was a food desert in the first place. Right. You know, like, and, and, and it's not like you unsee that. We don't go, you don't go back. It's like Neo, <laughs> you don't go back and forget that you had this better blacker alternative available to you the whole time that you just weren't utilizing, you know? And s seriously, like, I love collard greens. My mom used to cook collard greens. I've never cooked a collard green in my life. My wife didn't know how to cook collard greens. I'm not gonna unlearn that recipe. I've already two, three times cooked the same pot, vegan <laughs> collard greens, it's delicious. I'm not gonna unlearn that, you know what I mean? So likewise, I mean, I don't know, maybe this metaphor is a stretch, but I feel like, I feel like, um, you know, it, it's, it's now that we have this information and, and there's a crack in the armor, we can move forward with, with, with all, you know, with Godspeed towards, um, you know, towards shifting those systems towards something that makes more sense, towards something that's more equitable, towards something that's, that serves more of our people. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what gets me excited about this moment is that, you know, the fragility of it all, uh, it, we, the cracks have, have been exposed and we're not as helpless as we thought we were. We have more resources and more abundance, and more resilience, mm -hmm. perhaps than we knew because we were, as we're fighting the system, we're also comfortable with the status quo because that's what we know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think this is a real opportunity for us to turn the corner and uh, we'll need artists and public servants and uh, and folks in the community to 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 make sure that we uh, kind of continue on the sustainable path. Right. I definitely want more public servants to sit down with creatives. I want that to happen more often, and I and I need there to be always an Afrofuturist present. <laughs> I think <that's> <laughs> like <laughs> the best combo deal. 
So I have a question that I, I'm starting to ask everyone, of course, duh. What does the Afro future say? <laughs> Ooh, what does the Afro future say? Um, yeah, I think the Afro future says to me, uh, when I think about Afrofuturism, you know, the, the, the image that is burned uh, into my psyche is, uh, is Sankofa, the Sankofa bird. You know, Sankofa is this Ghanaian concept that is symbolized through an Adinkra symbol of a bird moving forward and looking backward. And uh, I think that that uh, that's what the future says to me. It's move forward and look back. Sankofa means in tree, it's uh, the Akan language uh, or the language of the Akan people of Ghana. It means go back and fetch it. But it means like, as you're moving forward, look back, look back. What can we learn from our ancestors? And so much, you know, going back to Jordi LaForge, AKA, you know, Kunta Kente, AKA uh, LeVar Burton, you know, um, you know, the, the, the thing that the oppressor are trying to do, one of the first things that they did to Kunta was they tr changed his name. They took away his past. They tried to erase his identity. And in reclaiming that ancestral knowledge and wisdom is an act of radical rebellion. And for us as Black people, whether, you know, um, living in Americas, which is my experience, but also in the diaspora, even on the continent, post-colonialism, it's really important for us to remember the names of our ancestors, remember their practices, remember what they did and why, remember our stories, and, and to shape our future in, 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 with that memory uh, and standing on the shoulders of those um, people who uh, laid the foundation for us. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the, that, that's what the future, that's what the Afro future looks like to me. It looks like riding, riding dirty with our ancestors, um, you know, and, and, and incorporating their best practices into our future. Yes, I think this is a, a really wonderful time for us to remember and investigate what those practices are and hopefully have the courage to, to engage them and expand them, right? Because we are in a, a new era and we have our, our, the technology has grown since then. So there's ways mm -hmm. to, to implement uh, these ancestral practices while still being in the present and working into the future which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love what your Afro future is saying. <laughs> so are there, um, we're going to wrap it up. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, but uh, is there anything that we should be, anything else we should be looking forward to? And uh, where can we find out and follow you, find out more about your work and follow you? Sure. Uh, well, my name again is Pierce Freelon, and that is also all of my social media handles. So um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, even uh, LinkedIn. It's all Pierce Freelon. Um, so you can find me and follow what I'm up to there. Um, yeah, if you're interested in history of white people, the uh, historywhitepeople.com is the website where you can learn more about the premiere that'll be premiering on July 4th. And I hope, I hope to have at least a track from the children's album out by Father's Day, um, which is in a couple of months. Uh, I think the album will be called Dad. Um, and I can't decide if that'll just be Dad or Dad will be an acronym for something uh, open to suggestions. Um, but yeah, that I think, um, yeah, for me, that, that's it. That's it right now. I am um, honored that you chose me to have this conversation with. It's so good to see your face and to hear your voice. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, of course. It's a pleasure. It's good to see you as well. Uh, so tomorrow we have Janata Pretas Nasa. 
I really need to ask her how to say your name, <laughs> but she is Janata on Instagram. Uh, she's an amazing author. She did uh, a young adult uh, novel, most recently wrote that and published it. I can't wait to talk to her about that. It's very teen, Afrofuturist, and queer. Uh, we will be here at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on this Zoom link. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you, Pierce. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to all the attendees. I see somebody put LeVar Burton in the comments. So yeah. I'm so glad. Yes. I'm make so sure, glad I'm not the only fan. Yeah, make sure you send us the link so that we can distribute. Uh, I'm sure everybody wants, is looking forward to hearing it. And I get to hear it right now. <laughs> yeah, it's just a preview. It's an unmixed like preview. So yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.